Hi, I'm Brian Hale, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the congregation from New Horizons Community Church in Skowhegan to a better life. Grab your Bible, and let's look forward to some teaching that's straight from the Word of God. We're so glad that you're here. Good morning, New Horizons Community Church. For those listening online or on the local cable access, I want to welcome you all to our service this morning. And I'm very glad that you have decided to join us today, because today is Mother's Day. Today, mothers will be inundated with phone calls, small tokens, large gifts, cards, and handmade creations of all shapes and sizes. I, I noticed a few of those handmade creations this morning, actually, out there. Uh, and what a joy it is to see it on mothers' faces, how much they appreciate those things. I remember giving my mom a, uh, well, it was back when we were kids and we were learning to make pottery. And everyone in the class made ashtrays because they're easy to make. It's a bowl with some ridge and there it is. My mom didn't smoke, but that's the only thing I could make her at the time. So she got an ashtray. What a wonderful thing. You would get moms all the handmade decorations at your kids and they're like, mom, look, 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 mom. And you're like, oh, oh, that's lovely tell me about this because it's like oh i don't really know what it was but such love that you guys portray it just blows my mind and moms you taught us how to be good members of society how to clean behind our ears how to navigate friendships and how to gently apply a band-aid when we fell down or when we were pushed down by a sibling moms you also force fed us green vegetables you even made us miss dessert if we didn't eat them. How much love is that? For all of those things and many more moms, we say thank you. And we cannot express our love for you enough. I'm very fond of a quote from one of our presidents during Mother's Day. He, and he said it this way. He said, my mother told me everything in life happened for a purpose. She said all things were part of God's plan, even the most disheartening setbacks. And in the end, everything worked out for the best from President Ronald Reagan. It amazes me that regardless of where we see them, we can easily recognize a good mother. Whether we see them at a sports game or a restaurant or even at Walmart, good moms are easy to spot. The character of a great mom can be spotted from a long, long ways away. You know, through the Bible, the great character of moms has been preserved, and I want us today to take a look at just one of them this morning. I was going to do all the moms of the Bible, but it got really, really lengthy, so I was like, oh, we probably don't have that much time. But our text for today is located in the Old Testament, and we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And if you want to, I ask, encourage you to please turn ahead in your Bibles to there, or on your smartphones, your muted smartphone, uh, or if um, that doesn't work for you, it'll be up on the screen as well. So before we get into it, I want to give you a little context for our story, because it's going to help really shape the story. Now, if we were right now to go back in time to when 1 Samuel was taking place, the nation of Israel would have no king. Instead of a king, they have an appointed judge, a judge that guides and directs the nation. And that judge serves as God's chosen guide for the nation of Israel. Now, currently in 1 Samuel, the judge is a man by the name of Eli. And the nation of Israel is, is not a strong nation right now um, at this point, but instead it's a, it's a loose group of the 12 tribes who gather together and are led by this judge named Eli. We are, or would be entering, into Israel's history at a very critical point because the 12 tribes are starting to lean towards wanting a king to rule over them. They were getting a little uh, disgruntled, a little upset. They saw the other nations around them that had kings, and they said, well, we want that. We want to be like that. We want to be like them, and whole nother message on wanting to be like the world and, and emulating them, but we're not, we're not going to go there just yet. But they wanted a king, and they were told that if you have a king, your young men are going to go to war. You're going to pay taxes. It's going to be harsh. And they said, that's fine. We want that. But that's further in the story. We're not quite there yet. So let us pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 
And I'm going to ask that we stand and follow along as we read God's Word. So I ask that you would please follow along with me as we read. There was a certain man from Ramoth, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Altna, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Toa, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penea. Penea had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penna, and her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept poking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, I, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramoth. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. May the Lord be honored for the reading of his word. You may be seated. I'm a big fan of old sayings. I really like some of the old adages that have come up. And there's an old adage that says, You know what you're made of when you are pressed. My grandfather used to say it a lot. And it's referring to what comes out of you when you're squeezed by life's trials, by the stress and the situations you're in. If you were to squeeze olives, we get olive oil. If you squeeze fruits and veggies, it produces juice. In your notes, the character of a person is revealed when they're put under the press of life. So our question this morning what kind of juice would you produce if you were squeezed? Let's look at Hannah's life and, uh, and how, how when she's squeezed, what kind of character she has, what she's producing. We read in our text this morning that she was the childless wife of a man named Ekna, squeezed. We read that she was one of two wives of Elkna, squeezed. We read that she wanted one thing, a baby boy. She didn't have it. Squeezed. We read that she was under constant stress from the other lady, Penna. Squeezed. We read that this went on for years. Squeezed. Can you imagine the stress that she must have felt? Can you imagine the feelings of inadequacy that she felt every single day? Do we read in our text that she was angry all the time? Do we read that she was bitter and resentful all the time? 
Do we read that she lashed out at others who accused her falsely? Do we read that she hated the other woman who had everything she longed for? No. We don't read any of that. Hannah had great character. When others provoked her, she didn't provoke back. When God closed her womb and made it impossible for her to have the one thing that she ached for, she didn't despise God. She didn't disown him or stop believing in him. Rather than that, she continued to reach out to God in prayer. And this morning, there are three points that I, I want us to, uh, to look at and kind of glean from the text today that show the character of a godly mother. Three points that require us to look at them and to see where we're measuring up against. So the first one in your notes is this. Number one, Hannah knew how to respond to people with grace or not at all. This is a tough one. How many of us, how many of us are fighters? I see a bunch of hands in the back already. The sound booth is a bunch of fighters. Oh, yeah, see? You know, fighters, you know, we, we like to give it right back when it's given to us. We don't back down from an attack. Oh, no, no. We stand toe-to-toe -to -toe in an argument. <sighs> fighters. And I know that some of you out there, you like a good fight. I, I'm one of them. I, I like a good fight. The issue, however, and there's a problem with wanting to fight all the time, the issue is that for some of us, it's come to define our relationships, either between husband and wife or maybe wife and daughter, wife and son. It's, it's what defines our relationship. It's all we ever do is fight. It's something that we expect to do, and uh, in some ways we might feel lost if we stop fighting because it's happened for so, so long. It's all we do is fight. That's all we know. Um, many years ago, when I um, started dating my wife, um, we were much younger, and to date myself, we had, a, we had this program on the computer called Instant Messaging, and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's long ago. Before you guys that know Facebook, it's like Facebook, but much simpler. Um, and she lived up in Orono, and I lived in Auburn, and it was, like a, it was 122 miles from my, my dorm parking lot to where she was. I, I drove it a lot, 122 miles. So I didn't go up there all the time, but we could talk on the computer. And um, if you know my wife at all, she's very quiet most of the time. She's fairly reserved, doesn't say a whole lot. Um, I can attest that it's not that way, but that's fine. Um, but back then, in order to get her to talk to me, I would, I would have to pick a small fight with her. You know, I would intentionally kind of poke her a little bit because she wouldn't talk to me. You're just looking at your computer screen and nothing going on. And I'm like, hee, hee, hee. And, and, I would, and that's the only way that I could get her to talk to me. That was it. it was, that was it. And, and you know, I, I felt bad. But when I realized it, I, I had this other problem of if I stop arguing with her, what are we going to talk about? It's like this has come to define our relationship. So I ask you, and myself now, what if we were to take a page out of Hannah's book and respond to those in your life with grace? I want us to notice that Hannah, in our text today, did not engage in a verbal battle with Penah. She did not do it. She did not engage her. She chooses, and that's the key word here, she chooses not to respond at all. You see, grace in relationship means not always pointing out all the flaws, all the mistakes, all the missed opportunities, all the dropped balls or all the unmet expectations all the time. Now, whether this is your husband or your wife, your son or daughter, your in-laws or your outlaws, stepchildren, stepparents, aunts, uncles, dog catchers, it doesn't matter. Choosing to respond with grace is the better way to live. That's the better way to do it. In the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he spoke to this very issue. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, we read this. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Pastor's wife, Karen, she calls this kind of language kingdom-building talk. 
kingdom building talk. So I ask, is, the, are, is or are the words that are coming out of your mouth kingdom building? Do your words lift people up or they tear them down? Are you building the foundation to make people strong or are you ripping them apart? If it's not kingdom building talk, maybe, maybe we need to think long and hard about what we're saying. Now Hannah, Hannah had nothing to say, nothing at all, that would have extended grace to Penna. When she was being picked on and tormented year after year after year, she chose not to say anything at all. But I want us to look at the contrast when she spoke to Eli in the temple. Now remember that back in those days, it was very common to speak your prayers and petitions out loud so that all in attendance could hear. So when Eli notices that Hannah's lips are moving but there are no words coming out, he assumes that she is drunk. Otherwise, she would be praying out loud. Now, at this time, there's, there's many people coming in and out, and Eli would be used to this kind of thing. He's pro she probably would not be the first person he's thrown out of the temple. And as Eli approaches her with the intent on removing her, since obviously he doesn't want an intoxicated person in God's house, you see, the temple is, like I said, the temple is very busy this time of year with everyone coming and going, and for it was the time of sacrifice. And all the nation of Israel, all 12 tribes, would be passing through in about a week's time. It's a really, really bad time for a drunk person to cause a scene in the temple. It's just, it's just not what you want. We can understand that. You know, she probably wouldn't have been the first person that Eli had to remove from the temple that week. So when Eli speaks to her, it's not out of hate or, or with malice or he's, he's not frustrated with her. He speaks to her with a heart of compassion a heart that wants her to strive to be better. And his intent is to encourage her to live a better life. Look at how Hannah responds to Eli. Her words are full of grace. She says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Now notice that Hannah does not lash out with a sarcastic response. She doesn't yell at Eli. She doesn't belittle him for not understanding. Can you imagine for just a moment Eli's surprise when Hannah addressed him? He thought he was dealing with a drunk person. He was expecting slurred speech, wine breath, and a drunk. Now imagine the shock when instead he was addressed by the clear speech, respectful tone, and grace-filled speech of a woman who was deeply troubled. She said, look, what you're seeing is not what you think you see. Rather, let me tell you what is going on here. And so she tells him not what she was praying for, but rather her condition. She doesn't spill the dirt of what's been going on her entire life. She doesn't complain. She tells him that her heart is deeply troubled and she's pouring her soul out to God. And Eli realizes what he, that he was wrong, realizes his mistake, and he ends up blessing her instead. Eli thought he was going to throw out a drunk and instead he blesses a young woman who was seeking God. Our second point, when you respond to others in grace, you open the door for grace to be returned to you. When you treat people the way God wants you to treat them, it opens the door for them to return that very same behavior to you. Now, my little disclaimer here, they may not always respond to you with grace and compassion. Grace extended is not always grace received. They may not always be polite, but that is no reason for us to show them anything other than God's grace. I want us to to turn my, we're going to turn the new, the new Testament for just a minute. But I want you to look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. 
Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Treat people with the respect, even though it's not shown to you. So even though Eli treated her like a drunk, even though she was emotionally drained and at wit's end, I mean, honestly, that's really the hardest time for all of us to show grace, isn't it? At the end of a long work day or a long work week, when we've poured ourselves into our jobs trying our best to stay positive, we've missed sleep, maybe we've lost a meal, or when you're hurt or, or when you're, you're struggling with pain, I went through this with my wife, and I didn't realize it, but constant pain drags down your spirit. It sucks you right down. It's really, really hard. And at those moments, who gets our emotional leftovers? Who gets the rest of whatever we have left in the tank? Our family does. They're the ones that see us at our most graceless moments, at our most exhausted times. And it happens to all of us. Nobody's exempt from this. We all have our moments. We speak without thinking. We speak without grace. We speak without love to those we love the most. I think we can all learn from Hannah's interaction with Eli. I think we can all learn to pause and speak to our loved ones with grace, with love, or not at all. And this works both ways as well if your boss is rude and cranky treat them with love and grace if your spouse comes home and is snappy and short with you and the other members of the family show them grace in how you speak back to them even though they haven't shown you grace first you see we have to move beyond the the childish notion that i will be nice to somebody if they're nice to me first. We have to get beyond. God wants to get beyond that thought that I will only be nice to you if you're nice to me first. That's not how God wants us to live our lives. Last week, Pastor Hale talked about focusing on the positive and not the negative thoughts. Grace, thinking on grace is part of the positive. If you focus on God's grace, and I mean really, really focus on it, and you pay attention to how you address other people, grace is going to flow out of you, and it's going to change your attitude and the attitudes of those around you. It's going to have a positive influence. Speak with grace. Learn to speak with grace. It's tough. It's not something you get all the time. And we talk about these things like they're high and lofty, but they're small steps over all the time. When we get saved, we're supposed to chase holiness next. This is part of chasing that, that dream of holiness trying to get better all the time, speaking with grace. Now the next piece of the story we want to pick up is how Hannah addresses God and her her response to God. We see that when Hannah prayed to God, her prayer comes from a place of deep respect for God. Hannah, she recognized that it is God alone that her hope and purpose can be found. Notice that her prayer is not just for herself. It's not a a selfish me kind of prayer. Well, yes, she does pray for God to give her a son, but she wants a son so that God will be honored. Her desire is to become a mom, and she desires her child to serve her God. Her prayer honors God. But that's not the way we normally pray, is it? Is it? We don't normally pray like that. We typically pray for God to give us what we want so that we're happy, so that we're content, so that we are better off. It's what I call a teenage prayer, and not because the teens pray that way, but I call it that because it's the kind of prayer that I prayed as a teenager when I didn't know any way else or any any way to pray. That's simply how I prayed. When I was in high school, I had one prayer, and I prayed it every single day, and it went went something like this. this. Dear God... It's Aaron again. Um, In case you have forgotten, I'm asking you again for the funds to buy the 1985 Camaro um, IROC Z28. It's just down the road, God, you remember? It's just down the road from where I live. It's teal, you remember? It's got the short throw shift kit in it. I would really like that. And if you help me, I will drive it to church every Sunday. (laughs) That's good prayer. 
But that's how we pray, isn't it? God, give me a good job so that I can be comfortable, so that I can finally afford all the things I really want. I mean really, really want. God, give me a cute boyfriend so that I can have a date this weekend and not stay at home. God, tell my wife to let me go fishing this weekend. God, give me, God, give me, God, give me, 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 blah, 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 blah. None of that is God-honoring. Although, although, I think I would still like to try and honor God with a Camaro. I'm just saying, I'm pretty certain I could probably pull it off somehow. You know, or at least have the chance to try it. No, that's all I'm asking for. Uh, but in the New Testament, we find that there's a really great letter written by a disciple of Jesus named James. Now, James is a really neat and awesome guy, and, and I'll tell you why. You see, James is the brother of Jesus, but he didn't claim Jesus as his risen Lord and Savior until after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. You see, James was a little late to the discipleship game even though he grew up with Jesus. Could you imagine growing up with Jesus? Just, just This is all free. Could you imagine growing up with Jesus? That must have been tough. James, why can't you be like Jesus? He never messes up. I mean, come on now. Anyway. Yeah, imagine growing up with your brother. He's like, oh, at least I'm not like my brother. I well, we couldn't say that. Anyway, um, unlike some of the other letters in the New Testament, James writes a letter to Christians everywhere. It's not addressed to any particular church. And in this letter, he writes this. In James 4, 2, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Ouch. Now, the words wrong motives here, they're a little confusing, actually. Um, and if I spent some time, I looked back at the little translation of the Greek text, and it, it actually translates better as badly or wrongly. And, and I know that's really bad grammar to say that, but, but look at what it says when we sub that word in. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not perceive because you ask badly or you ask wrongly that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You see, James is telling us, all of us, that if we pray and our intent is to get God to give us something for our own guilty pleasures, pleasures, we are asking wrongly. We ask badly. Our motives for praying are bad. They're wrong motives. James is saying to us that our prayers are selfish prayers, and that's not how we're supposed to pray. Our third point. Hannah asked God for something that would ultimately be God-honoring. Something that would be God-honoring. How different would our lives look if in our prayer life we prayed for the things that would honor God first? What if instead of praying for God to give us a, a good job so we can have all kinds of stuff, what if we asked God to give us a good job so that we can help with the ministry of the church, to help us give more to missions, to help reach out to those in need so that he might receive all the glory and honor that's his anyway? What if we didn't pray for God to simply to fix our spouse so that our life is easier, but rather prayed and asked God to change us into the compassionate, grace-filled spouse who can love them like God loves them? What if instead of praying to get what we want, we pray and ask God to give us what would honor Him best? Do you see how the focus changes from what we want to what God wants to give us. He is, after all, our good Heavenly Father, the giver of all things good. When we pray powerful, powerful prayers like that, it changes our hearts and our minds to be more in line to where God's heart and mind is. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, the world that we live in today tells us to buy what we want. When we want it, and to think only of ourselves when we do it. That's the world we live in. But God says, pray for my will. Pray for my timing that I will be honored. 
Hannah prayed this powerful kind of prayer. And I, I, I'm blown away by what she prayed for. She knew that if God chose to answer her prayers and actually gave her a son, that she would only have what she asked for for a very few years at best. She knew that if God gave her a son, she would soon be giving him back to God to be raised by the priest Eli. I can't imagine that kind of prayer. Give me a child I'll only have, be able to, to enjoy for just a few years, and I'm going to give him back. Her prayer would be that her son would be forever in the service of God. And what a son God gave her. This is the other end of the story. Hannah soon, soon thereafter gave birth to a baby boy, and she named him Samuel. And Samuel was the last judge over Israel. He anointed both King Saul and King David. This is the legacy of a godly mother whose character can urge us all to become more grace-filled in our daily interactions with others. Her story should inspire us all to look at how we live our lives, how we treat other people, and how we pray to God. Today, I want to encourage you all to pursue a life that would honor God, that would honor God more. And I, I plead with you to show grace to others just like Hannah did. And by doing so, you will honor God and further his kingdom here on this earth. So in the beginning, I asked you, what would you produce if you were squeezed? What kind of character are you? Now, the, 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 the Bible-reading Christian would say, well, I would produce uh, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, or the fruit of the Spirit. That's what, but are you producing those things? When you are struck by life's presses and you are squeezed, is that what comes out of you? I know in doing this study, I, I have some work to do. I have some work to do. Like, oh, I don't, I don't always, I'm not always the most patient person. I'm not always the most forgiving person. I have some work to do. And I know we all do. So let me encourage you just to continue to run that good race, continue to move forward, continue to try and change. Ask for God's help in changing. So this morning, before we get ready to close, just allow me to pray for you this morning, and then we're going to leave here. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this message. I know it's short, Lord, and, and uh, that people have places to go. And Father, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would come upon us this morning, Lord, that you would show us where we need to work. Father, that you would show us where we need to show grace, that we would become a people of grace. Father, that by showing people grace first, Father, we can spread your kingdom. And Father, I, I know it's hard. I know that we're not going to get it right all the time. But Father, your grace that covers us all is amazing. And you have great forgiveness for us, Lord. So Father, I just want your Holy Spirit to come down and encourage us this morning to try to live a better life, to strive for holiness, Lord, above all things. Father, then, and, and in doing so, Lord, we may not make it all the way, Lord, but we will honor you in our lives. Father, I ask... Uh, Again, Lord, that you would be with the mothers today and uh, that they would have a very special time with their families. In your holy name, amen. Folks, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you back next week. Well, that concludes this morning's broadcast. We're so glad that you joined us. Hey, if this program has been a blessing to you, drop us a line and let us know. We'd like to know how we're doing in our community and reaching out with the word of God. God bless you, and we'll see you next time for a better life. Life is drawing me to my knees.